We're going to talk about um, the circular and the collaborative economy uh, this morning. And I want to start with uh, Joe Illis. You're the digital co coordinator of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And I think uh, you can help us understand better the concepts of circular and collaborative economy. Can anyone hear me? Ah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so I'm a digital coordinator for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. We're a charity from the United Kingdom. Uh, we've been running for about just over three years now. And our sole aim at the, at the foundation is to accelerate the transition to a circular economy. Um, it's a phrase that has been around for a while. It's not a completely new idea. It's one that, um, that we've been working on, but it draws from a number of other concepts. And I've heard it mentioned um, two or three times since I've been here, um, since yesterday, uh, which, is, which is great to hear because about three years ago, um, it wasn't really a topic that was widely discussed, but now we're hearing people discuss this idea of a circular economy. And, uh, and this is what we think the circular economy might look like. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been used to a linear economy, and that's what you, you're can, you can see down the middle of this diagram. It typically goes from take, so we take stuff out of the ground, we make something out of it, and ultimately, we chuck it away. Um, it's um, powered by fossil energy, and there's loads of waste at every stage of this system. Um, but it's the predominant industrial model that we've been used to um, for the past couple of hundred years. In a circular economy, um, it's, a, it's a different model for an economy that is regenerative by design. And in a circular economy, flows of materials would fall into two categories, and uh, some of this is derived from um, the work of Bill Madonna and Michael Braungart, who some of you may know from uh, Cradle to Cradle. Um, so on the left-hand side of the diagram, you can see um, biological materials. So this is, these, are, these are materials that can return to a food and farming system, and they can safely biodegrade or go through a materials, uh, what we call a cascade, which is something I'll, I'll discuss more uh, a, a, in a moment. On the right-hand side of the diagram, you can see technical materials, and these are stuff like polymers, um, metals, um, and th these should cycle with, without a loss of quality. Um, you can see there are a number of different loops on either side, and there's different value to be had in, in these different, different loops of, an, of the circular economy. Um, so this is the, the kind of top-level view of, the, uh, of how we picture this, this, this new industrial model. Um, and we see it working in four main ways through the analysis we've done. Um, firstly, the, the power of the inner circle. So basically, if a product, um, if, it's, if it's still working, don't mess with it. The less you have to transport a product, repair it, clean it, maintain it, um, remanufacture it, and, or even recycle it, so uh, the, these tighter loops, that's where the value is to be had. And, and I think this is, um, this is one of the areas where there's a great crossover with the, with the sharing economy and some of the business models that we've been hearing about over the past couple of days. Uh, circling longer. So the longer you can keep a product functioning in the economy, the more users it can, it can have, the more use you can get out of it. Again, a, a real source of value creation, getting greater productivity out of the resources and energy that you've put into manufacturing a product. Um, cascading materials. This really is a, a, a great opportunity on the biological side of the circular economy. Typically, um, a lot of biological waste is just incinerated. This is really a shortcut um, for, for getting the energy back that you've, you've put in to, to grow or create a biological product. What might be more interesting is to explore materials cascades. For example, taking clothing, which could then go into, um, into stuffing for maybe uh, automotive um, seating or, or, or bumpers. Uh, it could then go into maybe insulation, or, and then maybe a, a rock wool used in an agricultural setting, and then anaerobically digested. Through these cascades, there's a huge amount more value to be gained um, over just incinerating uh, biological waste. And then pure materials flows. This is important for two, two main reasons. One, for, for a safety point of view. Again, a, a, big, a big push with cradle to cradle um, is is, is around the indoor air quality that materials um, give, uh, but also for the point of uh, keeping materials in a, in a cycle. So a lot of what we hear about recycling now is that it's, it's actually downcycling. So um, you might take PET bottles, which is actually um, 
a, a food grade, quite high quality material. And if you turn them into, um, into insulation, uh, that, 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 you've lost the quality of that polymer. It can't then be turned back into a, into a food, grade, uh, food grade plastic. Um, so by, by keeping a pure materials flows, it enables you to have a higher quality of, of material. So those are some of, just some of the principles and some of the ways that we see um, companies, uh, the circular economy playing out in companies and, and the way people are innovating. Um, and it, it has gained a, a lot of traction. A, a UN Global Compact study um, with Accenture recently said that a third of um, global CEOs are considering uh, are considering the circular economy in the next 10 years. And we think there are four main reasons why this is, this is taking place now. Firstly, we're seeing a lot of tighter regulation around resources. Many people will know about, um, about, about environmental uh, constraints around emissions and, and about energy use, but also prices are a real problem for, for, many, for many companies. Um, throughout the, from 1900 to, to, to 2000, over that century, we saw uh, real price declines uh, through efficiencies and, and new, accessing new reserves of resources. Um, and we saw the, the price declines for over that century erased in the past decade. So many economists think that's not a trend that's not going to be reversed. Um, higher prices are here to stay. Um, some, some argue, what a, who cares? We can, we, if we can cope with a gradual increase in, in resource prices, we can pass them on to the consumer or throughout the supply chain. We can cope with it. Some companies might be able to do that for a time, but uh, another issue that's, that, that's problematic is volatile prices. Um, the average EU car manufacturer uh, saw a raw materials price increase of around 500 million euros in the year uh, 2011, and they have an annual operating profit of around a billion. And that's, so that's, that's price fluctuations that they can't really control, uh, sudden price shocks that can be really detrimental to, to uh, business viability. Um, investment opportunities, uh, investors are uh, increasingly looking for more reliable long-term investments uh, and a, a, a business or, a, or a, an economy or, or system that's more resilient to external shocks through energy or price fluctuations um, could be a more sound investment. And then two areas that I think are really crucial and, and, and for this event and why we're seeing the circular economy really take off. One, the rise of the new consumer. So we're seeing a, a consumer who's less concerned about owning stuff. They just want the access to it. They've got smaller homes, they've got s smaller wallets, um, and they just want access to a service rather than owning it outright. And then enabling technology, um, the growth of the mobile web, and also the ability for tracking and, and tagging of, of products uh, has, made, has made new business models more feasible than before. So we think this is a great economic opportunity. Um, we've done some studies um, with McKinsey, uh, the consulting firm, and come out with, the f with uh, through, through analysis of FMCG product, products, um, medium live complex goods such as phones and washing machines, um, and through global supp supply chains of an economic op opportunity of around um, $1 trillion uh, per year through materials cost savings. And there, we think there are four ways of doing this. One is through radical design. So a lot of the products that we use today, um, your, the phone in your pocket, your laptops, they're, des they're not designed to be repaired, um, uh, remanufactured, or, or the materials recovered. So there are a number of tweaks that we can make to design to make um, more, more circular business models easier. So this could include um, using less adhesives, uh, not using proprietary screws. Um, there are some amazing active disassembly technologies that would make opening up um, phones and laptops uh, much easier. And, and there are a number of companies doing a lot of great work in this space. Uh, innovative business models. So this really feeds into ideas around the performance economy, so the ideas of Walter Stachel that some of you may be familiar with, um, and, and the, all the collaborative models that we're, we've been hearing about, and, uh, and you'll be hearing about from, from Adam as well. Um, so business models that, that just provide access to a service rather than ownership, or, or, or get maximum productivity out of, out of products. Um, Skills in improving skills in the cascade or, or reverse cycles. So we're really, really good at putting sh stuff on shelves and then getting it out. We're not so good about getting products back. Um, I know uh, some clothing manufacturers like H&M are, 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 are piloting um, 
uh, clothing capture back in their stores. I know electronics companies are experimenting with, with, re with reverse logistics. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's a lot more work to be done. And, I th and companies like La Poste could, 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 uh, could be key in that. And then cross-sector collaboration. Um, this, the circular economy isn't about one company uh, on its own um, or even one sector, but it's a, it's, a, it's a shift in the economy that requires huge amounts of collaboration between companies, governments, um, educators as well. Um, these are some of the companies that we work with. So um, the foundation uh, works with a, a group called the Circular Economy 100, and, um, among others. Um, and we're really trying to catalyze business innovation uh, among, among this group. I'll, I'll come on to in a, in a moment about how, just about how the foundation works. But I, w I really wanted to discuss um, two case studies that I think are really exciting. Um, one is from our far partner, uh, Philips. So this uh, was mentioned uh, yesterday, I think, already. But, but Philips um, had a request from an architectural firm in the Netherlands uh, called Rao Architects. Um, and this, this really uh, um, visionary CEO of this architectural firm said to Philips, I want light for my offices. I don't care how you do it. All I want is the light. If you have to use an LED or a, a traditional bulb or this particular type of light fitting, I don't really care. I just want you to provide the light. Um, so Philips went away, and they designed the absolute best lighting system they could. It's, re it's a smart lighting system. It reacts to the sunlight that's coming in through the windows, the presence of people, uh, motion detectors, and so on. And that now they sell something like uh, 230 lumens of light at desk height to this architectural firm. There are a number of uh, advantages to this system. One is that um, Philips pick up the bill, so it's in their interest to continually make that system more efficient. Um, they can provide upgrades and better service to the customer, and then they can recapture the raw materials at the end of its life. Uh, maybe they can repurpose that in another building or, or just recapture the, the metals and, and the valuable materials in, in, in those components uh, to be reused. And then, kind of from, from the other end of the spectrum, a startup, in, in, the, um, in our second economic report called to, uh, Towards the Circular Economy, um, we, we discussed this idea of a Netflix for clothing. And, and f for an audience like this, I'm sure it, it, would, it doesn't sound that far-fetched. Uh, but, but for some of the audiences that we speak to, it, it sounded a bit crazy. Um, and I'm definitely not saying that we came up with the idea. But, but it's, so it's great to see these guys, uh, La Tote, um, offering uh, $49 a month for unlimited clothing and accessories rentals. So um, you say what you want, uh, and um, you say, I'll, I'll have uh, this particular uh, necklace and dress. It's mainly for women, not, not really for me. Um, but uh, it turns up on your doorstep in a bag. You wear it for as long as you want. If you want to keep hold of some of it, if you want to buy it, you just don't send it back. Um, and then it, and you, you, can just, you can just, like Netflix, get as much... Uh, as many different clothes as you like. So really a model that supports fast fashion. A lot of discussion is around, oh, but, but people just want new stuff all the time. If you design the system right, then, then potentially you can. Just a bit about the, about, about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation itself. As I say, we've been going for, since 2010, um, and we run a, a number of different programs. So we work in three areas. I've, I've discussed a bit about insight. So we, we work in, in, in insight, producing reports, case studies and analysis on the circular economy. But what's really important to us is that there's action there as well. So um, we're on a number of different programs. The Circular Economy 100, where we're working with um, businesses, uh, with regions, um, uh, with, um, and with universities and startups uh, around coll uh, collaborative problem solving, networking, and analysis. Uh, the Schmidt MacArthur Fellowship is a, is a fellowship program working with a number of universities around the world, such as MIT, Yale, Stanford, uh, TU Delft, uh, Kedge Business School, and uh, Tongji in China. Um, uh, circularity indicators, we're trying to be able to measure the circular economy. Really difficult. It's really easy to measure a linear economy, what you put in at one end and what you get out the other end. It's much more difficult to measure a system that's complex like the circular economy. But we think that's really important and be able to offer, uh, maybe be able to prove the effectiveness of that system. Uh, the uh, Project Mainstream, a project that we're doing with uh, World Economic Forum McKinsey um, around, uh, around uh, scaling up the circular economy across global supply chains. And then finally, one that I, I, would, I would really encourage people to, to kind of find a bit more out a bit more about 
is our Disruptive Innovation Festival. It's an online festival. It's taking place in October. It runs for four weeks. Uh, and we'll be having um, headline acts, uh, stages uh, on, on different subjects around the circular economy and, and other issues curated by the foundation, and also an open mic session. So for anyone who's got an interesting idea can, uh, can contribute. So um, come and speak to me afterwards about, the, about any of these things. But, uh, uh, I think there's huge crossover between the, the sharing economy and the circular economy. Uh, hopefully, we can explore that a bit more. Thanks a lot, Joe. Thanks a lot, Joe. And I think we will have some questions at the end if we have five minutes uh, left. So, uh, but ne next, let's uh, see how one big company uh, in France can apply uh, the circular and the collaborative economy. Um, Antoine Doucin, uh, so I have three questions for you yeah. but the, f the first is like why are you here as a sponsor of the fest as a partner as one of the main partners and on this panel uh, first of all it's a pleasure to be to be here i <laughs> dis discover uh, we share fest and it's amazing so i'm very happy to be here uh yes b b before uh, talking how we we work on we are working on the a circular on collaborative economy. I think it's necessary to 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 talk about why. And for that, uh, very rapidly, very quickly, shortly, I think it's necessary to to give you some key points to to better understand the the big issue uh, for 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 La Poste uh, in the next decade and why the circular on on, on collaborative economy. Is, is a real uh, objective for, for, for the group. First of all, La Poste is really a company. Uh, you, you, you know La Poste, you use uh, all the, the postal services uh, uh, on your daily, uh, uh, daily life, but uh, La Poste is a real company. We have shareholders, like any shareholder, they expect return on equity, so we have the pressure. Um, La Poste is financially an independent company. We, we don't receive any subvention from state for its business activity. We have uh, uh, public activity and we are paid for that. Uh, but for all our business activity, uh, we have our balance sheet on PNL to equilibrate. Uh, we generate the last year 22 billion uh, of euro uh, of revenue on the almost uh, six, six uh, hundred net profit. La Poste is a complex and very huge group. You, we have 200 subsidiary, uh, 270,000 people. And La Poste have, except for the banking activity, have a, a B2B model. Roughly 80% of our business is B2B. Um, to the next point, La Poste is operating into a mass market. We need volume uh, to cover our fixed cost. Whatever the volume, the cost are the same. We are in a uh, fixed cost model. And unfortunately, or uh, luckily, I don't know, La Poste compete in a, comp compete in a competitive field. Uh, and we have to fight against tough competitors, ba banking, uh, is fighting uh, against all, 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 all the bank, parcel with DHL, UPS, FedEx. On mail, uh, which represents 50% uh, of, of, of revenue, is fighting against substitution, uh, digital substitution. Uh, Experts predict that at the end of, of 2020, the volume of physical mail will be divided by two. It just means five billion over for the group. Uh, imagine a plane full of 270,000 people. Uh, and you, you are aware that something is, is wrong, something is going wrong, but you don't know why. You don't know what. what. And Captain takes the microphone and announces that one on the main engine, the traditional main activity, has failed and will lose 50% of its power before landing. It's the situation, it's a reality. So 
we should find new additional activity and revenue. Now, I think you, you better understand why our 2,000 Two, uh, our two, uh, uh, sorry, 2020 strategic plan is called Conquer New Territory. New Territory means new economy, digital economy, circular economy, collaborative economy. Uh, and we think we have compet competencies, capacity, 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 sorry, uh, assets to succeed in this area. It's, so it's why we are really concerned. So you're here to explore yeah. the, the collaborative economy and to, to get inspired by, by I mean, I mean the, the projects that are featured in the Wisha Fest, I yeah. guess. But you've already started to apply some, some of the collaborative economy and circular economy principles. How is it working now at La Poste? Yeah, we, of course, but it, it won't be the... the the main topic of my talk, but of course we uh, revisit, we redesign uh, um, our, our process, our uh, value chain. On, for example, we, we launch the green mail, you know, the, the letter which doesn't take the plane. Uh, it's uh, cheaper, uh, it's lower, but we have reduced uh, our negative externality. So, in our value process, on with uh, for all our offer, we 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 try to apply uh, the the circular concept. But it's not the topic. Uh, we we began to 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 work on circular economy in our own assets. So. Uh, long time ago, uh, we, we, we had a partnership with a non-profit organization and we made a donation, you know, to, to uh, um, on this, we, this, uh, this object is a, is a good example. We, we had, uh, we passed a, a partnership with uh, Extramuros, with a, uh, uh, non-profit uh, organization and we we provide we give uh, all our assets uh, all our pre-owned uh, assets uh, and they transform they redesign uh, all this uh, stuff uh, so, so for example this uh, this thing is made of Old main yes, bags, right? Yes, yes, okay. exactly, exactly. So it's uh, the idea. So we, the, the first step was uh, donation. The second step, but we are always uh, talking about our asset. Uh, the second step is uh, uh, reselling. We have uh, a lot of vehicle, and we have organized uh, a reselling. Uh, uh, website uh, in B2C uh, to, to, to sell our uh, old vehicle. Uh, on the third step uh, is sharing. We, we try to, uh, we have a lot of vehicle, we have a lot of building, uh, and we are, for example, running a proof of concept, uh, an internal proof of concept, uh, to, to share our vehicle fleet. Uh, and it's, uh, yes, it's, it's uh, the connection uh, between circular and collaborative economy uh, about our assets. And, but the, the, I think the, what is really interesting, the most interesting, is after uh, uh, working on our assets, we we decided to, uh, to, to, to work on the asset of the other. So we launched, uh, we launched uh, a subsidy of uh, uh, um, re recycling uh, services activity, which, which, uh, which called uh, Rossigo. On Rossigo, uh, I, I said that 
uh, we have less and less mail, you know. Uh, so we have uh, less and less mail to deliver and to collect. But our postman, we have 100,000 post, uh, postmen, uh, are visiting uh, all the citizens, all the company, every day, everywhere. So uh, we decide to launch uh, a recycling activity to collect uh, paper. Uh, so we launched this activity one year ago. Uh, and it's, uh, we, our market is uh, only the decentralized uh, wasted. We don't want to be in competition with a huge recycling company who uh, are in charge of uh, a big uh, industrial uh, unit. Uh, we want to collect the waste uh, everywhere, you know, the, de we, 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 the decentralized waste. Uh, so it, it has been a, su a succeed. Uh, we launched this activity one year ago. Uh, actually, we generate four billion, four million, for the month, four million uh, euro. We have collect uh, ten uh, thousand tons of paper. Uh, but the next step uh, will be to extend product we collect, and we we are. Mm. So not only paper. Yeah, ex exactly. Wh what else? Yes, what else? Uh, what else? <laughs> uh, we, we we work on it. It's not uh, uh, a current uh, activity, but we work on it. Uh, we we want to collect uh, this uh, this uh, this type Smart of phones, uh, yeah. device, uh, glasses, uh, uh, bicycle. Uh, every stuff we 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 could uh, we could collect. Uh, what is important also is we, we try to integrate into the value chain of transformation uh, and valorization. We try to integrate uh, the non-profit organization local, locally. Okay. Uh, and our project is to collect all this stuff and we think, we are convinced that because we, we will collect uh, uh, this, uh, this material, uh, we will be able to, to find a, a collaborative way uh, for the second life for this uh, stuff. Just an example, we work on it, it's a project, but it's a, a real project. Uh, we think that if we, uh, if we collect, uh, for example, bicycle, uh, there is a market. I, I, I saw the, the debate yesterday about uh, the collaborative economy of the city. Uh, we are convinced that there is a market for a uh, small or medium city which need to have a, a, a velo libre service. I don't know how you say uh, uh, free... By, bike sharing? Yeah. Uh, we, we think that there is a market uh, for little and medium uh, size uh, city who can't afford uh, paying for a, 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 a system, a complex system. Uh, and we, we think we could be, uh, for example, an operator uh, for this uh, target. Uh, and because we, we, we collect uh, the material and the product, uh, we we think we will be able to uh, to use this stuff and to uh, yes to 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 build uh, uh, a collaborative economy uh, with uh, with it. Yeah, well, the collaborative economy is a sharing economy. Needs yeah. places, need people uh, to be intermediaries between uh, between people. So, uh, so La Poste uh, as um, as strength in uh, in in that area which is trust also because i think it's been told about uh, yesterday but uh, you also 
are providing services uh, to enable trust between people, the IDENUM uh, uh, service. Okay, thank you very much. And um, now I want to um, let uh, Adam share with us um, his personal experience because Adam is a co-founder of Yerdl, which is a marketplace where people can exchange goods for free. Um, but he has also um, a long time experience in environmental activism. And so I'm sure you have lots to, to, to share with us um, about the links between collaborative and circular economy. Great, thank you. I, if I stand, if I may. Well, can you feel it? I, I really feel uh, the, the passion, the excitement. It feels to me like, maybe Robin, we're, we're at the beginning of a movement here, um, which is kind of exciting. And oh, even better. I, I actually would sort of say that we're not just at the beginning, we're perhaps at the end of the beginning. And what I'd love to spend the next few minutes on, um, is there a clicker or something I can, or maybe you can just, yeah. oh, great, um, is talking about where that beginning takes us. Um, so on here, my daughter, Pearl, who just did a great job, I thought, earlier. Um, we, uh, uh, this are on our trip to Paris, we started with a Lyft uh, car, with a car sharing in, um, or a, a, a using a car from, uh, uh, this woman, Nico, who was happy to take us and it was a great experience. And now more and more people across the world are experiencing the sharing economy. This is something that they know, they like, they're having a great, happy experience with. So it feels like it's something really good and really big. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's very small against the type of challenges that we face on the planet. This is a satellite map from the state of Mississippi in the southern United States. This week, Mississippi had a hailstorm with four and a quarter inch uh, uh, balls of hail. That's I'm sure, that this big. I mean, if you can imagine a four and a quarter inch ball of hail coming down, the size of that is absolutely extraordinary. And climate change is beginning to push other things like this. This is from the New York Times this week. There were 2,500 people killed in Afghanistan from a mudslide. Um, it's extraordinary the facts just keep on coming over us. Uh, and you know, I'm not probably the only one who believes that it's time to actually take radical action against the type of threat we face by climate change. I'm a longtime activist. At 13, I got absolutely scared by Al Gore uh, when he told me about what climate change was going to do to us. And all that seemed to have come true. At 23, I became the president of the Sierra Club, which is the oldest and largest grassroots environmental group in the United States. And I never really believed that civil disobedience was actually required until now. Um, this is me in front of the White House. This is me being dragged off in front of the White House. And I, the reason I point it out is that that is how uh, important I believe our success is. I believe that the sharing economy is perhaps the greatest lever we can push to take on challenges like climate change. And the challenge for us is to ask, are we doing it far enough, fast enough? Are we making this movement something that actually can tackle something as big as the warming of the planet, as something as big as the threat to our civilization as we know it? And that's the challenge I'd like to discuss for the next few minutes. As I was uh, kind of reveling in that kind of sorrow, looking at the facts of what climate change was and asking whether the things that I was doing was actually going to do something about it, I had the chance to visit Dharavi, uh, the, the slums in the middle of Mumbai, a million people in the center of, of the great uh, city of Mumbai live in Dharavi. And I met this woman named Sheila Patel who, won, who runs Slum Dwellers International, which works at building saving circles among poor women in Dharavi, where women without a bank uh, save a little bit of money each day by going around to each other's homes and collecting that money. They don't need a bank. They don't need an institution. Um, they are themselves the institution. Uh, and they have some very simple uh, rules to manage the saving circle. And to give you a sense of how this is spread, there are 60 million women across the world who are in saving circles like this. And these are the, sim the three simple rules. Do it every day. You must save every day. And I would say we must share every day. You have to survey your community. You have to know what's happening of people on your block. You need to know all the details about that. And then you have to commit to spreading the word, to taking these ideas and spreading them out there. And I took very much that inspiration uh, to form, uh, with a wonderful team of people, the idea behind Yurtle, which is a store, a community, where people give and get things for free. But to understand the, the blocks, why we aren't sharing more, we have to go way back into our history to understand why people are so fascinated by the next new thing. People, and Americans in particular, 
today suffer from neophilia, the need to always have the next new thing. And to understand where that comes from, we have to go way back into our history, way back to the history of the world. So if you'll allow me for a second, the universe was created 13.73 billion years ago, the Earth perhaps 4.5 billion years ago. For the next three and a half billion years, it was mostly single cell creatures. Perhaps a billion years ago, we got to multi-cell creatures. 500 million years ago, fish. 200 million years ago, mammals. 20 million years ago, the great apes. Uh, about two and a half million years ago, hominids. 200,000 years ago, humans. And about 40,000 years ago, at a period of a great evolutionary necessity, when humanity was leaving Africa, uh, there was natural selection towards those people who actually wanted change, who searched for the next new thing. Those were the people who survived, who actually decided to go and find that next great thing. And at that time, we now know from evolutionary biologists, the dopamine D4 receptor in our brain was created the dopamine D4 receptor. And that is the thing that triggers neophilia. That's the thing in us that gets excited when we see that shiny new thing, that shiny thing that we all must have, that next new thing. It also does wonderful things for us. It makes us explore the next new ideas, why many of us are involved in the sharing economy, why us are involved in the circular economy, the collaborative consumption world. We want to actually find the next new thing. And marketers have taken advantage for that as long as they've been marketing. This is an ad from the first department store in the United States called Wanamakers. And when Wanamakers launched in Philadelphia, it was the first of everything. It had the first, uh, the first pneumatic tube system, the first lights, the first money back guarantee, the first set prices, the first restaurant. It had a pipe organ. It had all the things you could imagine to make people just explode with glee and excitement. When, when, when Harrods opened, they had the first escalator ever in a, in, a, in a department store. And as people went up the escalator, they had to serve brandy at the top because people would faint from the excitement. They were so excited by what was happening because we're programmed as people to take the next new thing, to be excited by it. And that has been exploited by marketers very effectively. The problem with that is that we've now accumulated so much stuff because of that excitement that we're overwhelmed by it. In America, hoarding, the idea of pulling things together and having way too many things in your life has become a great psychological challenge. In fact, the American Psychological Association has now added hoarding to the DSM, the, the, the list of common psychological problems in America. Self-storage has gone up by 1,000% in the last 30 years. 80% of the things in our homes are used less than once a month. And it's a problem. And people buy things. This woman, and this is a, a magazine, if you ever fly in America, I, I recommend you don't read this. Um, it's called Sky Mall. And this woman is, is wearing a slanket. It's, it's not really a blanket. It's not really a jacket. It's a slanket. Um, she's also carrying a mug that has about 72 ounces of coffee in it. We are enthralled by the next new thing, and it's making us sick. So here's, here's an example of what happened. This is my coffee maker. It was given to me for my wedding. I, I quite liked it. And I don't know if you can see it. It says error two on the top of it. Well, error two means it's broken. You have to throw it away. I looked it up. You can't fix it. It just means you have to throw it away. So I could go on to... a e-commerce site like an Amazon.com and order a new one. Or I can go to my friend Kevin and say, do you have a coffee maker? And he does, and this is the coffee maker he gave me. This is my new coffee maker. It was used, it's perfectly good, and I'm enjoying it now. The coffee tastes the same, um, and I had a good chance to see my friend. It's a very simple sharing story, but it's very different than the way that we experience consumerism today. And that's the challenge we have to, to address. So, Yertle uh, was built to actually try to get people who are very comfortable with shopping to think about sharing just the same. It's a very simple uh, uh, iOS app and a, a website. Um, the items are listed. This is an example of a Patagonia jacket. We have a partnership with Patagonia where they give us jackets that have been returned and we um, in turn put them up on the site to give them away. And people post items, a thousand items a day on the site to give away. Uh, and there's a complementary currency system on it. So when people come and join, they get 250 credits. 
They can spend those credits on anything they want on the, on the app, and when they run out of credits, they have to post new things, new, new things or items that they have out of their closets in order to get more credits, and they earn those credits, and um, they can get anything they want. Um, and it's growing. This is an example. This is a Austin, Texas in, in March, um, and this is Austin, Texas in April. So it's you know, a little bit um, growing, but uh, it's very strange in America, in the US, to talk about sharing in some times because we're, again, fascinated by the next new thing. Everyone wants the slanket or the, the next exciting thing. Um, but um, what I want to suggest to you is that uh, this is actually not so crazy that it's becoming successful. It's actually inevitable. There's a saying in uh, the United States, when everyone gets excited about uh, a new invention, it's the, the, the best thing since sliced bread. Has anyone ever heard that? The best thing since sliced bread. It's, it's, it's in America kind of the pantheon of innov invention innovation. And I'll just for a second tell you the story of how sliced bread was created. It was invented by an inventor named Otto von Rohwater in 1928. And what he did is he brought a bread slicing machine that he gave to bakers, and they could quickly cut bread, put it in plastic bags, add some preservatives to it, and sell it. And if you've ever wondered why the bread is so bad in America, it's because of this inventor, Otto von Rohwater. Um, here in, in Paris, Pearl and I go to Dupin et Desiré um, every morning and have a beautiful croissant, and it's, it's wonderful. In America, the Tibet bread is terrible because of this in innovation. It's everywhere. By 1930, um, uh, the brand of Wonder Bread was, was introduced, and by 1933, the majority of bread sold in America was sliced bread. So just in five years, from small craft bakers to mass-marketed bread, and what I want to suggest to you is that we have a sliced bread challenge here with a sharing economy. Will we innovate and not think about the consequences about what we're creating, or will we innovate and build something that will actually take on the types of challenges like climate change that really face us? Will we innovate and build the rules so that it's not large bakeries that all of a sudden run the entire bread industry, but instead craft bakers who have technology to do what they need to do without side effects like preservatives, without side effects in the sharing economy that will harm our ability to grow and scale. And I just want to end with a, a quote from uh, someone who's been a great inspiration to me, but this is a man by the name of Miles Horton who founded the Highlander Center, which was basically the place where the civil rights movement was trained and born in the United States. He worked with Rosa Parks uh, during the uh, Mon Montgomery bus boycott. Martin Luther King worked at the, the Highlander Center. Um, and he challenged us to think about what a movement is. Uh, he said, it's only in a movement that an idea is often made simple enough and direct enough that it can spread rapidly. Then your leadership multiplies very rapidly because there's something explosive going on. People see that other people, not so different from themselves, do things that they thought could never be done. They're emboldened and challenged by, what, by, by that to step into the water and once they get in the water, it's as if they've never not been there. So our challenge collectively is to step into that water and to, to build that movement. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Adam. Um, from your presentation and from Joe's, um, actually, I have the feeling that the meeting point between circular and collaborative economy is maybe the movement that you were just mentioning, the circulation of resources. Is that, am I right, or what do you think? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think that is right. I think um, it's really, we're certainly seeing a huge amount of momentum, and I think what's almost more exciting in a way than, than the, the economics of it. We, I mean, th we think we, we've got a, a fairly good picture of it now, of, of how there could be an economic benefit for, in the circular economy, but really how um, people are innovating through, throughout, through this lens. We, we work with, um, with young people uh, in schools, and one of our favorite stories um, is that we were speaking to a, um, a uh, 
student, and he said when he was doing his GCSEs, he was doing uh, design and technology. He said when he was doing his GCSEs, um, he, he couldn't think of anything to design. He thought that everything had be, been designed, like we have toasters and we have phones and ketchup bottles. Uh, and then he learned about the circular economy and said that everything he sees, he wants to redesign. Um, it, it does open up new opportunities. And I mean, one example I was just looking at before this, it's been around for a little while, was just a concept for um, a collaboration between, uh, between Zipcar and a, before it was Avis, um, but Zipcar and um, like a camping provider. So you would check out um, a, a mini clubman online, um, you'd book it. It has like all the best camping equipment in the boot. So you hire it for that experience. So not only do you get the mobility, but you also get um, a, a, a camping experience as well. Everything in the back would be RFID tagged so you know where the stuff needs to go and if you've left the, the sleeping bag on the floor or whatever. So I just think there are a huge number of opportunities. I mean, Yodel's a great example, but there, there's just so many uh, in this room and, and, and out there of, of, of sharing platforms and, 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 uh, and, and sharing businesses, but in, in product design, in, in kind of take back schemes, in, in, in energy and, uh, and disassembly, and all these different subjects are, are really getting, getting explored through a circular economy lens. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Well, um, maybe we'll take w one or two short questions. Yeah? Okay, we have time for two really short questions from the audience. I don't know if we have a mic here. Yep, yep, no. I'll just say this well, as, as the next person comes up. One of the nice things about um, the circular economy fits in, in very much a B2B framework in a very effective way. The sharing economy works very well as a front end conversation with, with citizens as about how they can actually engage. That's, that's sort of the, the interplay that we see working a lot. Yeah, we, we have a question over there. Hello, um, I'm from Berlin. I'm working for an initiative against uh, planified obsolescence, obsolescence planifié. I don't know the word in English. Um, you know? <laughs> Anyone speaking Pla German obsoles here? Uh, <laughs> planned obsolescence. Okay, yeah. you know? And so we are working on it to inform people about it. And I would, to know, um, I would like to know, for example, for La Poste, if you are, have this in mind, um, perhaps uh, to um, sell only phones which not have this problem, for example. And uh, I think it's also, uh, I would be interested in um, contact with other international partners, perhaps after. That's my question. Yeah, well, it's true that uh, you can buy some phones now. It's some post office, and have you have you y worked yes, on planned yes, yes, we are. We we are a, a mobile phone operator, and you can f buy a phone uh, into all our and post I, office. I, I, yes, but I think that the question was, was about was it the question? No, the the question was about planned obsolescence. Obsolescence programme. Okay. Yes, but we, we, d we, we but are not. not your main activity. Yes, we are, we are just a retailer, so it's uh, it's it's we we, are, we have a responsibility. Yes, to as as a retailer, but uh, I think it's uh, it's how the product is uh, eco design. Uh, um, yeah. But maybe if you if you pick up the phones. Um, uh, at people's houses, then you will also learn what's the problem with these phones and maybe be able then to choose yeah, the, sure. the best providers. Yeah, sure. But... Uh, Since you're, you will be responsible for the whole chain. Yes, but we are working, uh, as I said in my English, so sorry, but uh, as I said, we, we are really working, w working to, to, to collect uh, the, the used, uh, used phone and to organize after the second life of, the, of this uh, stuff. So we, we think about it. Thanks. And as a quick questions, we only have two minutes left. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, on the first day we talked uh, with Rachel and she warned us about greenwashing the collaborative economy. Um, and I guess I was very interested about your opinion on this. Are we cutting off half the people who maybe don't believe in global warming? You know. This is not me, uh, but uh, the risk of not including these people because we're using words uh, that turns them off, uh, whereas sharing and collaboration and some of these things might not. But as soon as we tie it to a certain movement, uh, we've lost people. 
I, th I, th yeah, I think that's a really interesting point and um, something that we've, we really t try and take a lot of care about at the foundation um, is about uh, what, we, what we'd call framing, so how we frame the debate. Um, and and we, we think that there are some really amazing um, environmental benefits with, with increasing the amount of products you remanufacture or, how, or share um, and get more use out of. Um, but from, just from experience, we've found that when you go into a room, you might get, if you, it, you might get a third of people if you go in with the kind of environmental argument, really. So you, and that, that'll probably be the third that were on your side to begin with. A third you'll actively switch off, and a, a third um, maybe they, w they won't really care. So um, uh, it, it is an interesting, in, interesting question. I, I don't know if Adam can contribute at all, because when I went on the Yerdle website, I really just got the impression it was for my convenience, and that it would it it would be a really it'd be a nice platform to use, and and I could get some things that I I maybe couldn't afford to to go out and buy. I didn't get the impression that I was going to be doing it because it was a nice thing to do, really. Um, and I don't know if that was maybe a, a plan or if it was. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, I, I clearly I'm a zealot, uh, but. Uh, we want to have a very welcoming open side in. So for some people that may be a way in, but most people it's it's really the convenience in saving money, right? That's that's the first benefit. And I think our first challenge in the sharing economy is to really perform our primary task wonderfully and beautifully. Because if we fail at that, we're sort of like a bad, badly working um, uh, squiggly bulb. You know those those CFL light bulbs that in the 1990s we all bought or tried to, and the light was terrible and they didn't really work, but we got them because of the right thing. We don't want to be that with the sharing economy. We don't want to be something that doesn't work, but is the right thing to do. We want to be something that works really well and embedded inside it is, is this ideology that's actually going to change the world. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Adam, Antoine, and Joe. Uh, we need to leave the stage now. <laughs> but um, I'm happy to invite another uh, great pioneer of the collaborative economy on stage. Well, an applause for you.